Hi, my name is Jerry Croth. I'm a professor in California. I've done a number of videos on a number of subjects, and certainly this one. But this is a strange new thing. Uh, what would happen if we've heard about these congressional hearings? What would happen if the President of the United States said UFOs were real? Uh, that would turn your world upside down far more than you think. And that's what this talk is about. Your world would just come apart, okay? And I want to probe those implications. We are living in the dark ages and we don't know it, okay? <laughs> Imagine that you are an intellectual. You went to a college, went to a university, and it's 800 AD, okay? And that's the world around you. And you're kind of an elite person, you you're educated okay and you see around you all the things that are going on all right now you as an intellectual in the dark ages believe that uh, the earth is the center of the solar system ptolemy said so okay copernicus will not be born for another 600 years so you're work, walking around rather smugly thinking hmm, i i know about the universe and about the solar system Galileo will not appear for another 750 years to tell you that you were wrong, that the sun is the center of the solar system. And you're walking around thinking that you know what's going on. That's where we are today. If UFOs don't exist, yes, I agree, nothing changes. You don't suffer any serious delusions. Um, things are just as they seem. But if UFOs exist, folks, everything changes. Most of what you believe is wrong. Okay? You are living in a sequence of delusions and you don't know it. Stay with me. This is going to get hot. If UFOs exist, what happens is anthropology is in need of revision. Ancient history has to be revised. Human history is in need of revision. Evolutionary biology likely contains some very serious errors. Archaeology is incorrect. Mythology is incorrect. Philosophy and religion are in need of revision. It's big news. Okay. Huge implications. This story is bigger than Copernicus. This story is bigger than Galileo. It's bigger than Einstein. It is the biggest story in human history. So if UFOs exist, get ready. So let us start with step one. Are UFOs real? All right. I'm going to take you on a journey, but it's not a journey that you have you expect. I'm going to try a guided fantasy. You have an open mind. I want you to try to, just to play a game with me as we get started, okay? Play along, you've got an open mind. I want you to pretend President Biden makes a speech, okay? Let's play. Here comes President Biden and he's going to make a speech, okay? Just a little exercise. Imagine we make this, uh, Biden makes this hypothetical speech. Listen carefully to his words. My fellow Americans, I'm here to announce to you that UFOs and extraterrestrial contacts have occurred in the past. And I wish to tell you that all previous administrations who have said it was false were wrong and were lying to you. They did so because they did not want to cause panic. They did so not out of any nefarious motivations, but because think tanks and experts told them that informing the American people of these facts would destabilize society and cause panic and harm. I believe we are now ready for the truth. And the truth be told, we had an extraterrestrial encounter in 1947 at Roswell, New Mexico. And indeed, the U.S. government was confronted by an alien presence. A UFO crashed and bodies and artifacts were recovered. I want you to sit and think about this for a few days. And then I plan to return to provide you more information. But first, I hope you'll discuss this revelation with your families and loved ones and talk it over with them.
Be assured there is nothing to fear. There is no reason for any panic or stress. They are, these are simply truths that have been withheld from you for seven decades for what was thought to be in your best interest. Now it is time to disclose them to you because I believe the American people are mature and capable of assimilating this information. I will be back in a few more days' time. So there he goes, and he makes his speech, and we say, we're, now we're, we wait. In the meantime, the press is going crazy with speculation. A million questions are being asked. But we are told there's no danger. So we do discuss it with our families and our friends. And now Biden returns three days later. Okay, here he comes again. Play along, please stay with me. This is kind of fun, but it's, there's a purpose to it. My fellow Americans, now that you've had an opportunity to think about this, I like to put more flesh on the bones, as it were. In Roswell in 1947, a spaceship crash-landed and was recovered. Four small beings were inside and perished. We continue to have their bodies. They are human-like, but not human. They do not have the same organs that we have. They actually appear to our scientists to be something like organic robots, and they look almost identical to each other. They have large heads and about three and a half feet tall, we keep their bodies at Wright-Patterson Base in Ohio and have kept them there for the last 77 years. We performed autopsies and learned about their biology to some degree. Secondly, we do not know where they came from and have never determined with any confidence, nor have we ever communicated with them. A third important matter is that the United States was the beneficiary of some technology from this event. We never figured out their propulsion system uh, and we've been working on that for seven decades. But we did make some computer breakthroughs, some breakthroughs in material science, and even night vision goggles have come from that research. And to note, however, that our nuclear advances had nothing to do with this craft or this encounter. Beyond Roswell, there have been no further artifacts or crashes, or crashes to report. But there have been and continue to be many instances of UFOs flying about from continent to continent. In the past, these have been dismissed by the government, but many indeed were authentic sightings. Over the course of the next few weeks, I will be inviting uh, governments and scientists to review our work and to come and inspect the craft. Until then, sleep well and do not worry. Well, thank you very much for playing along. I'm but then again, it's not just a game that we play. Avi Loeb is the chairman of the Department of Astronomy at Harvard. That's a pretty impressive position to hold. He believes that President Biden will make a statement about UFOs in his State of the Union address. He does. This may happen. It's not as ridiculous as it seems. Now, here's some evidence that I want to present to convince you. That, But I want you to stay skeptical, okay? So, let's begin with Roswell. And I'm not going to go through the whole litany of everything. I read a book called The Roswell Foil, How UFO Discoveries Radically Change How We See the World. And I wanted to make it as thorough as I could. So, in, in Roswell, for example... Roswell was the base for the Enola Gay, which dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. It was the only nuclear base in the world at the time. And there were UFOs flying around it for three days, and one was struck by lightning and crashed. Okay? Now, I made a table of everybody who said they were there, they saw the debris, they saw the crash, they saw the artifacts, they saw the bodies, they flew the bodies to Wright-Patterson, and there were at least 45 witnesses. And, and that was in the early days of this book. Many more since. Okay. I was also impressed by deathbed confessions. So here's a woman who talks about her father keeping the secret right until he went to the hospital. And then telling his daughter. Uh, my father was in the Air Force. 
and he was stationed here at Roswell at the time in 47. Uh, he was assigned as part of the cleanup crew out at the site. He had the highest security clearance that their force gives, but uh, he was never able, nor did he ever attempt to discuss the incident. He passed away in 1988. He had uh, his last tour of duty was in Vietnam, where he acquired Agent Orange. Ended up with a, uh, cancer of the spine. He did not want to die at home. He wanted to die in a military hospital. And as he was laying on the gurney waiting to be loaded into the ambulance. He told me, he said, baby, he said, the story is true. He said, don't let anybody try to tell you any different. He said, the incident happened. There was a spacecraft and I kissed him and that's the last I got to talk to my dad. This is uh, Jesse Maciel in 1947. Uh, as an old man, he was an uh, intelligence expert. And this is what he said. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. Because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. It could not be. It, it could not have been. This is another guy named uh, Walter Hout, who was there. And uh, he made this, uh, and it was released after his death. The best of my reason, it was a relatively small body, comparable to uh, oh, maybe a 11-year-old, 10 or 11-year-old child. It was pretty well beat up. All right, so... Um, you say to yourself as a skeptic, okay, that's anecdotal data. My cousin said this. My grandfather said that. It's hearsay. I'm not convinced. Okay, where are some artifacts? Well, I actually have an artifact to tell you about, but I don't possess it. It's a long story. Stay with me because it's a very interesting story. Okay, that's the artifact. It's called the Roswell foil. I call it the Roswell foil. Uh, it's kind of, uh, that's a Photoshop now. That's not the real thing. So it's silvery gray. It is uh, about five inches by five inches. And I want to tell you, I've never seen a UFO, but I handled that material. In 1965, I'm teaching school at uh, tw 20 minutes from the University of Michigan, where I went to, I didn't get my PhD yet. I didn't even get my master's yet. And I'm teaching fifth grade. And a little girl comes up to me and says, my daddy says I should show you this. And I'm sitting there and she shows me this material. I think it's aluminum foil. She says, squeeze it. So I squeezed it. She said, let it go. Let it go. And it just completely opened up. No creases, nothing. I said, wow, that's not aluminum foil. And she said, no, really, really try to squeeze it. So I squeezed it down to the size of a marble. Let it go. And it just completely opened up. No creases, nothing. And I thought, that's really cool. She said, try to put a hole in it. And for some reason, I remember I had a metal desk and I took out a teacher's compass. See that pointy tip? And I took the teacher's compass. Now this stuff is as thick as a piece of paper. Silvery gray, a little bit bendable. I mean, stretchable. And I jammed it in and it did not puncture. Could not puncture. It just went like that. And then she said, try to cut it. And I said, is that okay with your daddy? And I took out three different kinds of scissors. And every time I did, it just did this and bent. You could not cut it. So at the time, I was I had no interest in UFOs. I thought her father worked for NASA or something. It was University of Michigan, maybe. And this is some kind of material they're developing for the space program. I didn't think about it for 43 years. All right. This is the I found 
a class picture. Somebody on Facebook saved it. And that's 1965. That's me right there. Black hair. And they think that the girl who brought the material was this girl here, but we're not sure. Now, 43 years later, I have to tell you about this. I am uh, retired. I have been a teacher in a university, a psychologist, retired, just enjoying myself in San Diego, checked out a book at the library called The Day After Roswell. I really, at this time, have no interest in UFOs. Just thought I would read it. I'm reading it. This guy said he was at Roswell. He said there were bodies and there was a crash. And they did uh, autopsies and they had white lymphatic fluid in their bodies. And I thought, what are you reading? This is such garbage. I just thought, would you just return the book to the library? This is stupid. And then I read the paragraph that changed my life. So he's talking about the crash and the debris. And here's the paragraph that changed my life. One of the materials discovered was a dull gray metallic cloth-like material that seemed to shine up from the sand. The officer at the wreckage stuffed it into his fist and rolled it into a ball. Then he released it and the metallic fabric snapped back into shape without any creases or folds. When I tried to cut it with scissors, the arms just slid off without making even a nick in the fiber. When I tried to stretch it, it bounced back. And I'm reading that and saying, wait a minute, I had that material in my hand. Where was I? What, what, what was I doing? Where, I, I remember that. I had that. Where? And I said, I was, I was teaching that was in that school. And I started searching for the little girl. Uh, a, a UFO guy said, try to find the little girl. What would a little girl be bringing classified material to her teacher and showing him? I mean, how did she get a hold of it? A Hollywood uh, producer said, I got a private detective, we'll find the girl. Well, she's about 55 now, and he didn't find her. But a Latvian private detective who uh, likes UFOs contacted me, said, I bet you I could find her. And he did. I'm not going to tell you her name. She's Mary. Uh, and she said, uh, I do remember you, Mr. Croth, but I never brought any material to class at all. Don't know what you're talking about. Complete dead end. That was our best lead. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm uh, uh, a PhD. I was, uh, I'm a scientist, sort of a social scientist. So who else has touched this material, I said to myself. And I started reading, and here we go with more uh, uh, tables. My book was not a bestseller, but I sure have a lot of tables. More tables and more tables. These are all the people who came in contact with that material. A total of 50 right now that I have found, and I included myself in there. Okay, here's, here's a couple from those tables. There was, this is from Charles Schmidt in 1947. There was some material that looked like uh, tin foil, but quite strong. You could wring it up in your hand. It would just straighten out. No kinks, no nothing. Just straighten out by itself. Thomas Gonzalez, 1947. It's an airfoil. Uh, he got it from the tr crash site. Raul, Paul Price, with his brother visiting the crash site, some of the Matisses just snap back in your hands when you bent them. So I got 50 of these people. Couldn't break it or scratch it in any way, yet it was flexible. Okay, so as a social scientist, I said, okay, I'm going to write to physicists and chemists, material scientists, professors, and say, what was I holding in 1965? What was the name of this material? What material has these properties? Was it invented yet? Please tell me what you think. And if you don't know what it is, make a guess. So I've got, <laughs> here's some more tables. 40 some professors re replied to me and they said things like the following. Here are a couple of them. The guy up on the left says he was a senior scientist of DuPont. He said, I think it could be Hytrel. Uh, any other guesses? No other guesses. A technical support guy uh, said, I, 
It is not polyamide with germanium coating. Okay, a Stanford advanced materials scientist said it is not super elastic nitinol. I have no other guesses. Uh, so a material scientist in Florida said it's not a nitinol that is currently in any production with that, that has those properties. So, of the 41 scientists, 50% had no idea. And the ones who made guesses said could have been nitinol, could have been mylar, could have been hydrol, could have been captain, could have been Kevlar. I bought all of those things. None of them even came close. Okay, mylar wrinkles. The other things are too brittle. You can cut them. Nothing fits. So that finishes the Roswell event and the foil. Now, are you convinced 76 years after Roswell, the foil is not produced or found anywhere today? I mean, it's how many years? 50 some years later. I have never seen it again. It is not available anywhere. If you know of this material with those properties, I'm not a rich person. I will pay you $500. Send me this material. Silvery gray, can't puncture it. The thickness of a piece of paper, can't cut it. And shape memory, it goes back to its normal shape at room temperature. If you find it, you send it to me. I'll send you $500 as a reward. I swear to God. From my pension, my teacher's pension. Okay, now... If you're, are you convinced that Roswell happened? Well, if not, there's a lot more, and I'm not going to take you through the history of UFOs. I'm going to bring you the most recent information. So buckle up. Okay. Beyond Roswell. Let's start with a video from the Department of Homeland Security. Watch this video. It's a bit confusing, uh, but they find... In a, in a short while, you're going to see this um, disc or whatever appear, and then they're going to kind of track it. But I want you to pay attention to the zigzag function of whatever it is that they're watching. They haven't got it yet. There. Okay, they found it. Here we go. We're tracking it now. It seems to be rotating or tumbling if you look closely. I don't know how fast it's going. Maybe you can read the things on the side there and figure that out for yourself. But I want you to notice, not only does it seem to be tumbling a bit, but it does zigzag. You're going to see the zigzag in a second. It could be a helicopter. Helicopters can't do that. Or a drone. What else could it be do it's doing this? I don't know how fast it's going. Maybe uh, some of you know enough about aviation that you can read the... Okay, did you see that zigzag? Okay, how do you do that? How do you do that one? All right, I'll take you to another one. This is an academic peer-reviewed paper published by Cornell. And I don't know how they managed to get this by the censors. The government sent out videos to a group of scientists at Cornell. I think they just wanted to report. I don't think they thought these guys are going to publish their results. They published their results. And I'm going to quote you from the UAPs, the UFOs that they were following. And here's the sentence. It says, flights of single group and squadrons of ships were detected moving at speeds from 3 to 15 degrees per second. Well, that's 33,000 miles an hour, okay? And they're, they're publishing that report. This is recent. Uh, this is uh, over the Los Angeles airport. Uh, it's a bit long, but I think it's worth your time. Go ahead. Colors like 670, Roger. I, I did report it. Um, do you have an estimate on the altitude? You know, they've got to be. Twilight 670, Roger. And uh, are they just white lights? They just keep going in circles. I was an F-18 pilot in the Marine Corps. I, I, I'm telling you, I've, I've 
never done any intercept. I've never seen anything like this. Twilight 670, Roger. Yeah, well, I was talking to the operational manager, and the only thing we could think of is satellites, but that, I'm sure those don't those aren't going to be spinning around. Absolutely, they're not satellites. They're in a big orbital that keeps going around after, around each other. And then uh, two more came in, and then one came down from the top. So just, just keep circling. Uh, 670, Roger. Yeah, uh, like I said, I, I did report it. Um, and Center American uh, 6. American 6, go. Yeah, we see some bright lights now off to the north of us, well above the horizon. Gets real bright and then gets dim, and we've seen it about five or six different times in same general area, but in different spots. It's pretty uh, pretty weird stuff. American Six Roger, and you said that was to the north of you. And how long was it happening? Because that I think that's probably the same thing that other aircraft was seeing. Yeah, it's happening uh, basically continuously, but uh, maybe 10 seconds apart. Um, just different bright lights that come on, get bright, and then go dim. American 6, Roger, thank you. I'll, I'll report that because they were, they were asking uh, up higher if I had any more reports, so thanks. You're welcome. Well, Central Center, our person, Tommy. It's me. Oh, no. Um, I have another guy reporting them. Really? Okay. American 6. American He's, 6. Is it off his right or left? He said it's to the north of him. He's probably 25 west of Catalina right now, and he said that it's continuous and the lights are getting brighter and dimmer. Continuous, dimming. Uh, there's more. This is all recent stuff now. This is a guy named Luis Elizondo. He was a U.S. counterintelligence special agent and former employee of the Office of of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. He knows about him. He came forward with some information. This is what he said. There is something in our skies. We don't know what it is. We don't know how it works. We don't know fully what it can do. We don't know who is behind the wheel. We don't know what its intentions are. And there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. Okay? They fly in the restricted airspace. All of that. Now, this is a movie that I made of another video presentation on UFOs. This is the video you're pretty informed about, but it's a very important video. So I'm going to repeat this. This is a 2017 encounter over San Diego uh, near an aircraft carrier. Fighter jets are sent up, checking it out. And these are, uh, now this is released in 2020, but uh, this is a Pentagon release, believe me. This is a Pentagon whistleblower uh, who you've probably seen on TV. He was uh, in charge of uh, finding out and starting a new investigation about UFOs, and he ran into an awful lot of roadblocks. Then he decided to become a whistleblower. Veteran, former member of that task force and veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, now formally blowing the whistle on secrets he says no one has ever shared publicly before. He is speaking one on one with investigative reporter Ross Coldhart, reporting for News Nation. When you say crash retrieval, what do you mean? Uh, these are retrieving non human origin uh, technical vehicles, you know, call it spacecraft if you will. Uh, it's probably not the right parlance, but. Uh, no kidding, non-human, exotic origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed. We have spacecraft from another species. 
we do. I found this very interesting. Senator Rubio, now they passed a law about whistleblowers, so people are coming forward. And they come to Senator Rubio. He has no opinion on it, but the, these are the comments of the whistleblowers that are coming to him. He's in the for whistleblowers to come forward. Sorry, people who have had firsthand knowledge, who claim to have firsthand knowledge of seeing this type of thing. Or, or have firsthand knowledge or firsthand claims of certain things. Uh, some are public figures, you know, and, and we've heard from them in the past. Others, um, you know, have, have, have not shared publicly. And so we're trying to gather as much of that information as we can. But I, and the reason why I'm being cautious, I'm not trying to be evasive, but I am trying to be protective of these people. Some of these people still work in the government. And frankly, a lot of them are very fearful, fearful of their jobs, fearful of their clearances, fearful of their career. And, and, and some, frankly, are, are fearful of harm coming to them. So that category of people who have firsthand knowledge, who say they have actually seen these kinds of things, do you find many of them credible? Well, I don't find them either not credible or credible because we have no basis. About, we understand some of these claims are things that are beyond sort of the realm of what any of us has ever dealt with. What I think we owe them is just a mature, you know, understand, listening and, and trying to put these all these pieces together and just sort of intake the information without any prejudgment or jumping to any conclusions in one direction or another. I will say I find most of these people at some point or maybe even currently have held very high clearances and high positions within our government. So you start at, you do ask yourself, like, what incentive would so many people with that kind of um, qualification, these are serious people, have to come forward and make something up? Well, uh, so this is a uh, congresswoman asking this guy uh, some interesting questions. I would not be surprised. Okay. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, let's go back to this, this book. Uh, I, it wasn't a bestseller, a lot of tables and a lot of witnesses, but I collected 520 witnesses of two UFOs, and there they are, and... Uh, well, here they come. And all those little blue lines are their testimony, their video testimony, their YouTube testimony. Uh, lots and lots of people who said, yeah, the UFOs happened. There they are. I saw them from my uh, window of my plane or wherever. Okay? So there they are. And I would like to just play a, a couple. Jim Cook. Looked like no aircraft I ever saw before. Object hovered no more than 15 feet above the water. It sent down a red beam of light. It seemed to be probing the water. He says it did this four different spots in the reservoir. Well, that's a book. It comes from that book. I reviewed that literature. All right. So in this, 100, 520 witnesses. But of these, 240 were expert witnesses. And what I mean by expert witnesses, they are not just citizens on the street. These are pilots, scientists, professors, insiders in the government, radar operators, cosmonauts, generals, 24 generals, astronauts, astronomers, navigators. So I want to have another little fantasy with you. Watch. We're going to imagine that these congressional hearings get wider and they're really opening it up like Watergate. Do you remember Watergate? There were 60 witnesses, and they had sworn in. Everybody in the country was watching these public hearings, okay? 
I and certainly willing to accept. Did you see this? Which did you see that? You know? Well, for instance, I did not know that, that Mr. Marx had been interviewed in June by the FBI. You said you didn't recollect that he, would, that he was interviewed. That's, that's, that's what right? I said. You didn't recollect. Yeah, I, I have no knowledge of that. And the, the, but if you... So uh, that resulted in the resignation of the President of the United States, first time in history. What would happen if we really had an open, honest, transparent hearing, and all of those 500 witnesses showed up, their relatives showed up, they showed their affidavits before they died, 250 experts testifying? What do you think the result would be? Uh, I think, and let's even have debunkers appear. Here's the result. This would be the most important paragraph you ever read in your life. And I think this would be the conclusion. It is the conclusion of this committee that extraterrestrial visitations of Earth have occurred and our planet has and continues to be visited by what appears to be a benevolent alien civilization. Now that is the biggest and most important paragraph of your life. I'm going to read it one more time. It's hypothetical. I believe this would be the outcome. It is the conclusion of this committee that extraterrestrial visitations of Earth have occurred and our planet has and continues to be visited by what appears to be a benevolent alien civilization. Now, pause and think, what does that mean? Okay, okay, big deal. Aliens came, I always thought it. Well, I always thought that was true. So what, big deal. Okay, so it's true. Fine, thanks for that. Okay, so now let's return to business as usual. I've always suspected that, so now it's true. Thank you. I'm sorry. Not so fast, Buster. This is so much bigger than that. So much bigger than that. Okay? This is possessing huge implications. The story is bigger than Copernicus, who said... That it's the sun that's the center of the solar system. It's bigger than Galileo. It is bigger than Einstein. It is the biggest story in human history. It is the biggest story of your life. There is no bigger story. All right, and that's what I want to look at. Let's leave the asylum that we're living in. We are living in the dark ages. 48% of Americans believe this is true, but 99% of the academic world says, no, 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 no way. Okay, they will fight to the, end, to the death and they will continue to call you crazy for believing it. It will take them a long time for them to come around, no matter what President Biden says. It took the Vatican 500 years before they said Galileo was right. Okay, so we're, so we're in an asylum. We're in the dark ages if UFOs are real. And if you say, okay, I believe this, and then you look around and you say, well, look at these other people. These people are talking about the Pleiades. They're talking about greys. They're talking about animal mutilations, astral projection. These people seem crazy. Are these my new colleagues, if I believe this? So what I want to tell you is that you're basically alone here. You're alone. And you need to recognize that when you say you believe that UFOs are real, you're on a precipice all by yourself, especially your career, okay? You better either keep your mouth shut or watch yourself. There are people like me and Tony Bregalia and Tom Carey, researcher, Professor Gary Nolan at Stanford, Jacques Vallée, Graham Hancock, Peter Surak, Leslie Keene, serious people, but there aren't that many who believe this, okay? This is serious stuff. This is real. This is not to be taken lightly. That's why they withheld it for 70 years, okay? They were afraid of the consequences. Now, let's talk about our, our awakening from the dark ages. Winston Churchill said, now, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. That's where we are right now. Our world is going to turn upside down, Push this okay? Back. And uh, lots of things that don't yeah. make sense are gonna start making sense. The things that do make sense aren't gonna make sense. Here we okay. go. 
But once we unravel oh this and we get out of the dark ages, some things are going to start falling into place. First insight from the dark ages. Here's our first insight. Holy shit. They've been talking about this forever. It's been right in front of our eyes. That's our first insight as we leave the asylum that we're living in. What do you mean? I mean, the Bible has been talking about aliens and beings and people from the stars and angels forever. In the Koran, 800 million copies sold. It's about heavenly people, star people. The story of Ezekiel right there was a story of a UFO in the Bible. The book of Enoch talks about God's coming to earth and inter interbreeding the most popular movies of all time, Avatar, E.T., Star Wars. We're obsessed with this subject. The ancient literature is full of this. The pyramid text, the Indian Mahabharata, the Mayan Popol Vuh, they're all telling you that people came from the stars. Wake up. You said, oh, I thought that was all fantasy. Well, what if it wasn't fantasy? That's what it means getting out of the dark ages. What if it wasn't fantasy? What if it isn't fantasy? What if it's real? What if all those stories were real that you read about? What if the ancients were trying to tell us this all along in all these books, and we said, oh, that's just fantasy, that's religion, that's mythology? No, they're telling you that this happened to us. And you've just somehow magically pretended that they didn't. So we're going to take our first step towards sanity. And we're going to start talking about archaeology. Now, before we do that, I want to introduce you to one of the best stories I've heard in all of my UFO literature. The story of Salma Siddiq. Okay? Before we get to archaeology, I need to explain this. You'll like this story. Stay with me. So uh, in Zimbabwe, 30 years ago, there's a upscale, uh, upscale elementary school. Kids are wearing uniforms, uh, kind of, I guess it's a pricey school, and they go out on the playground to play, and the faculty goes to the lunchroom for a faculty meeting. Well, the children go out to play, and a UFO is coming. It lands on the outside of their playground, a B and 62 children run towards the UFO and say, what's going on? And a being comes out of the UFO and floats down to the ground. Salma Siddiq is there looking at the meaning. Other children have run away and some are still there curious. And some of them are saying they were hypnotized. And the being said, there's too much technology. You're ruining the world with technology. Salma Sedek said that didn't get hypnotized. Now, here's Salma Sedek at the age of 11, African-American girl in a blue uniform. Uh, today, today, I miss Lisa today. And what did you see? Well, I saw um, a silver sort of thing. It was shaped. It was like lying down like this on the side. And I saw... A black man, he, he was dressed in black, and he had big eyes. Show me with your hand how big the eyes they were. were. shaped like something like that. So she's an 11-year-old girl, and people fly in from all, because the faculty thought they were crazy, and then they were all telling the same story. So a uh, psychiatrist from California or from New York flew in, um, and people interviewed them. Now, what I liked about the story is that Selma Siddiq uh, is now 30. She is not in the UFO circuit. She's not writing any books. She's uh, uh, got, got a, I think, a master's de degree. She works in a uh, municipality. And here's her 33. Well, 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 next to, she and I saw um, like a being. I Did you actually walk toward the object? We did not walk towards the object. We walked toward um, the the barrier of the playground, which is sort of where the being was, but not cross the barrier. We didn't cross the barrier. So it was really a lot of, you know, we were inquisitive. What What is this? I don't know what this is. And it's sort of, you know, any human being is going to try and rationalize what it is that they're seeing. And as an 11-year-old, we couldn't, couldn't really put into words what it was we were seeing and, and trying to 
justify it. And so, you know, it was uh, very in, in like a human esque form, um, but much shorter, um, really big head, really big eyes. If it did have a nose, couldn't really see it. But also the the the, the skin pigmentation was very very different it was very odd it was nothing like I'd ever seen before um, and the closest thing that I could um, compare what it was wearing would be something like a scuba diving suit it was just very form-fitting very black um, a little shiny at times um, but I don't know if that was just the Sun it was a pretty pretty warm day it was a beautiful day every day is beautiful in Zimbabwe actually um, so it was it was just a very normal day and then this happened um, so um, I was I, so impressed that she's corroborating her own story. I decided I would uh, write to her, and I got her email. So I said to her, uh, I'm a psychologist, and um, I wonder if you could answer these questions. There are very few human, human beings who have stood across from an alien being from another world. I'm cutting out some pictures. I cut out 10 pictures, magazines. I said, can you tell me, can you rate these on a scale from zero to 10? Which one comes closest to your memory? Zero means nothing. 10 means a lot. So she said, she said she was cooperative. She said, zero, 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 10, zero, 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 10. Two photographs and nothing in between. Here are the two photographs that she said were closest to her recollection of what she saw when she was 11 years old. She said she didn't see the guy from the side, but the color of his skin and the size of his head were accurate. All right, so strangely enough, that's very similar to what the people in Roswell said. Three and a half feet tall, large head, large almond shaped eyes. So let us now look at archeology. span And I want, why did I tell you that story? Here's the reason. This is rock art, 10,000, 8,000, 13,000 years old, from Colorado, Utah, Tunisia, Iran. Look at these pictures of rock art from these various places. Okay. What are they trying to etch in stone? Aborigine. Give me a break. There's even some medieval art like this. But here's what academic archaeology says. Read the journals. Here's what the journals say about those pieces of art. They're drawings and pictographs. They represent religious figures, superstitious ideas, practices of shamanic societies, doodles, Symbols with no obvious purpose, trance dances, hunting and gathering ruminations, drawings, drawings done in ritualistic trance states. Nowhere does it say these could represent drawings of ancient peoples who were visited by extraterrestrials. Nowhere. The archaeology department is called really the, Ar the Department of Disinformation, Amnesia, Delusion, and Denial. For any archaeology professor to say these represent drawings of extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial visitations, that's heresy. That's against the religion. It's against the orthodoxy. You can't do that. No peer-reviewed publications for you. No respect from your colleagues. No tenure, Mr. Professor. Okay, we live in the Dark Ages. You will not cross that line no matter how obvious it is. Here's another example from the Great Pyramid. Okay, we're still talking archaeology. We're still talking about the Dark Ages. So stay with me. So there's an, 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 an I guess he's an archaeologist, Wayman Dixon, way back in 1850. He goes to the Great Pyramid. Now, in those days, they let uh, academics go and take shit, stuff out. So he goes inside the Great Pyramid and he pulls out pieces of cedar wood that were used in the construction and a couple other things. And he takes it back to England. 
Okay, and then he, it's called, these are called the Dixon relics, it's pieces of cedar wood. He dies, he donates it to the University of Aberdeen. It sits there in a drawer from 1938 to 2020, 2015. And somebody says, hey, why don't we radiocarbon date the cedar wood that came from the Great Pyramid? And they did. So that study <clears throat> dated the wood at 3341 to 3094 BC, with a probability of 94% that that date was correct. Okay, that's the article there at the bottom with the authors. Big deal, you say. Well, um, that's nice to know. Well, I'm sorry, but that means that the Great Pyramid was built five to seven hundred years earlier than we all thought. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is big news. Uh, that's not going to go over too well. Okay, that's a pretty solid piece of science. Here's the history of Egypt. The Look at the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom. 3,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. You see that there? Okay. When was the Great Pyramid built according to conventional archaeology? Well, it was built by a pharaoh named Khufu in 2580 BC. That's the standard mainstream idea. He built it, uh, they didn't find his body, but little some, some little evidence that uh, he built it. Okay, well, one guy. But this new discovery puts it at least at 3100 BC. That's kind of a contradiction of terms. Let's say that again. That means the Great Pyramid was built even before Egyptian society got started in the pre-dynastic period, before the pharaohs. Hold on. Now notice that hieroglyphic writing has been dated at 3100 BC. Another said 3200 BC. A Yale study said the earliest example of hieroglyphic writing was 3250 BC. Stay with me. Okay, watch this. This is about to unravel. Big contradiction. I had to put in a drum roll for that just to emphasize what this is about. The radiocarbon study says the Great Pyramid is built between 3100 and 3400 BC. First hieroglyphs appear 3250 BC. Wait a second. You can't build a pyramid uh, that's the biggest building on Earth until 1850. Uh... And without writing, without planning, without math, without some kind of documentation. I'm going to say that again. The radiocarbon study says the Great Pyramid is built between 3100 and 3400 BC. First hieroglyphs 3250 BC. Average 3250 BC. This is a problem. Did the Great Pyramid... And Egyptian hieroglyphs appear at the same time? That's impossible. That means the Great Pyramid was built before Egyptian society even got started with the pharaohs. Okay, and it means that the Egyptian hieroglyphs started at the same time, or roughly at the same time. 700 years earlier, Whoa, 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 that's impossible. Okay, now the Department of Archaeology, which we could call the Department of Disinformation, Delusion, and Denial, says no, no, no. There's a dogma, there's an orthodoxy, and you will not cross that line. We insist that humans had to build the pyramids because there are no gods, there are no aliens, there are no extraterrestrials. There are, no, uh, there are no UFOs. There are no demigods. And that's the, that's the way it's going to be. We demand that you believe that. Therefore, we demand that Khufu built the pyramid. And your radiocarbon study only proves that they used 700-year-old wood. Really? So they built the pyramids and they used 700-year-old wood. Really? Why would they do that? Well, because they did. Because Khufu built it, okay? 
Now, there are 5,000 American archaeologists in this country, and there will be no professors of archaeology, none who say that any extraterrestrial intelligence influenced the building of the pyramids or Egyptian hieroglyphs, period. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there will be no peer-reviewed publications on that subject? There will be no respect from your colleagues. There will be no tenure if you cross that line. That's what I mean by the Dark Ages, okay, where we're living. You cannot go there. By the way, the name for Egyptian hieroglyphs is Medu Netjer, which means the words of the gods, right in front of you. The language came from Osiris and uh, the gods that uh, came and ruled Egypt. Their names are all over the place. Shh, you can't talk about that. That's mythology. That's false. That's fake news. All right, now, when this happens, when the president says UFOs are real, ev this is the biggest explosion in intellectual history. It marks the end of the, uh, the Dark Ages, like we have just discovered, like we have just described. Everything in the world changes, history, mythology, anthropology, archaeology. And now another one, get ready. We can now start asking questions that were forbidden to be asked. Did extraterrestrials influence the building of the pyramids? Was Zeus a real alien? Was, were the Greek gods who mated with the mortals and the immortals? Was, was that, did that actually happen? Was Osiris or Quetzalcoatl, these are mythological gods, were they real beings? Just how much of what we learned was false, fake news, absurd, dark age dogma. This is really big news. This is serious. This is real. This is not to be taken lightly. That's why they withheld it for 70 years, okay? They were afraid of the consequences. This marks the end of the dark ages that we are still living in. All right. Are you ready now for the last revelation? I'm sure there are many, but this is uh, another one. The last awakening from the dark ages in which we all live. Buckle up. Now, if UFOs are not real, you could laugh at me and say, this is all ridiculous, Jerry. And I accept that. But if UFOs are real, then this, I'm sorry, deserves to be taken seriously. So wipe off that smirk, skeptics. Because if UFOs are real, you need to deal with this confrontation, okay? Because that's what it is. Biological implications. I'm a, I'm a Jungian, I'm a psychologist. Jung said, uh, unlike Freud, Freud said, your dreams are hiding things from you. Jung said, you know, sometimes look at a dream and look at a myth. It's staring you right in front of your eyes. Open your mind and say, what are you looking at? It's right there in front of you. So here's a myth. Look at it. It's the nativity scene. What are you looking at for 2,000 years every Christmas? You're looking at the same scene that you're celebrating. You see a child that's born, uh, a celebration of a birth of a child, the mother is from Earth, and the father is a progenitor from outer space. He's the divine father, our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. You're celebrating the birth of a hybrid, an alien who mated with an earthling. We're looking at that for 2,000 years. Now, maybe that's a gross way of putting it, but that's what you're looking at, really, aren't you? 33% of the human race celebrates this every year. Now, that idea has uh, been in mythology for a long time. 
the gods consorting, interbreeding with humans, Sumerians, the Greek gods, Japanese royal family. It's even in Genesis 6-4, are the daughters of men. Okay, so let's take a look at a little bit of science before we go too crazy. We were taught in high school uh, that Homo sapiens was 50,000 years old. Not true. Okay, a skull was found in um, South Africa called the Omo skull, which is a biologically modern human being. You could have mated with this person. And the age of that skull is 195,000 years. Okay, so that's the latest. Uh, so we're, we've been here for 195,000 years, and Neanderthal was here for 240,000. So we were contemporaries. Now, science, actual mainstream science, has a problem. Why were human beings so slow in getting their culture started? Look at that yellow line. That's 200,000 years, okay, that we were roaming this planet. But look at the very far end, the 94th percentile. That's when we made a bow and arrow. That's when we started the first civilization in Sumer. Uh, that's when our first written language, we were just kind of slow for a long, long time. Okay. It took 190,000 years for us to get the idea of domesticating a goat. 190,000 years before we cultivated lentils and peas or domesticated a pig. 194,000 years before we developed bronze and copper. 194,500 years before we codified our first language. Why the slowness? Why the laggardness? Traditional explanations, first, we have, now we have bigger frontal lobes. That's not true. Okay, check it in my book. The science does not support that. The main explanation today is that we could not start agriculture until the Ice Ages went away. That's the Ice Age during the maximum. Now, it wasn't ice all that 200,000 years. Okay, it goes, oh, waxes and wanes and waxes. But at the worst time, that's what the planet looked like at Ice Age. Why can't you grow anything? Look at all the green areas. Why couldn't we were in Australia 60,000 years ago? Why didn't you do any? Why weren't you doing some agriculture there, huh? There are East Asia, Africa, Central America, all capable of supporting agriculture. Uh, chimpanzees survived, they were eating figs, figs were growing on trees. You could have grown some things, you didn't. That's another picture of Ice Age at its maximum. Just look at all the green areas. You could have grown things for a hundred over the course of a hundred and ninety thousand years. Why didn't you? Okay, hunting and gathering all that time, eh? Well, a book by a mainstream archaeologist, the ten thousand year explosion. One paleoanthropologist said the distance from the first bow and arrow to the International Space Station is only twelve thousand years. We got very smart very quickly. Why? Nobody really has an explanation, but mythology does. <laughs> All of these books looking you right in the face, they've been telling you that peoples from the stars, heavens, gods, deities came, interacted, bred, taught, did things with us, and we ignored all. That's fantasy. Well, that's an alternate theory, okay? So we have to have to ask the question, did we get edited? Do we get some new genes somewhere? Did something happen to us that made us so smart so quickly? So this is Mungo Man, discovered in Australia, 40,000 years old. But the, mo the most ancient example of biologically modern man, where you could retrieve DNA. So they got DNA from Mungo Man. And the DNA is radically different than our DNA today. So we got some new genes along since Mungo Man. Okay? Where did they come from? The mainstream hypothesis is that our population got bigger, and as the population grew because of agriculture, uh, genetic mutations came along. 
But Carl Sagan wrote a, wrote a book on biology, and he said uh, the chimpanzee big toe takes 150,000 years before it becomes a human big toe. So there's a long period of time for genetic mutations to occur. Mythology, which we ignore, says the gods came and edited us and um, manipulated us and bred with us, changed us, educated us. So are there any new genes? Well, yes, there are. There's the ASPM variant. That's relatively new. There is the HAR1 gene that has something to do with cognitive capacity. There have been 528 genes uh, related to neurotransmitters and related to cognitive functioning all within the last 10,000 years. Pretty unusual. All the references for that are in the text that I'm telling you about. So were we genetically edited? Is that It's kind of too strange to happen in just 10,000 years. Evolution of the humanoid primate on this planet is because of the genetic manipulation of extraterrestrial biological entities using this planet Earth like a laboratory. Well, that's conspiracy journalism. But if UFOs are real, uh, we might have to start taking that more seriously. Now, these evolutionary changes just happened too fast. There are, remember, no professors of evolutionary biology looking into whether or not we got any extraterrestrial sources of genes. That's too forbidden. Maybe now it will be more permissible to think about how this unusual cognitive revolution of ours propagated through the population. Were Egyptian pharaohs carriers of these genes? Now we can ask the questions no one could ask earlier about the origins of human intelligence. This is also marking the end of the Dark Ages for evolutionary biology. But believe me, it has not even started. Now the next question, I want to ask two more questions before you go. What do these aliens want and why are they here? What we have learned from reviewing all of the UFO literature is their crafts never initiate aggression, but they will attack if they're attacked. That we've learned. We've also learned that UFOs seem to respond to friendly behavior. Not many examples, but somebody in Australia waved and they waved back. Uh, they, one thing is certain, they seem to be observing us, okay? Especially our nuclear developments. That is what they're concerned with. Remember, Roswell was the first nuclear base in the world. Okay, but the UFOs have been seen over uh, ICBM missile silos in Montana and Wyoming, over Los Alamos. All these are nuclear installations. B-52 carry, B-52s carrying nuclear weapons. Bentwaters, UK, the largest nuclear base in Europe. UFOs sighted. Voronezh, USSR, Kostroma, USSR, Belokaravish, Ukraine, all uh, nuclear bases, all with UFO sightings. And the last one, Esfahan, Iran. I have done work on the Kennedy assassination, and the CIA was required to release documents. And they did. And I noticed in one of the documents that there was a UFO that landed in Esfahan, and I wondered, is there a nuclear facility in Esfahan? And guess what? There is. Iranian nuclear facility. So there are, they seem to be very concerned about our nuclear developments. But have they ever intervened? Well, there are only two instances where they intervened. And I'd like to tell you about one. The first one is in Montana at the Maelstrom Air Force Base, uh, Strategic Air Command Base. Ten missile silos were, were shut down, and um, there was a big scandal, and the Air Force said, how could that possibly happen? Well, they said uh, UFOs were sighted, and they shut them down. Okay, another story I think is very intriguing. Uh, it takes a while to tell this story, so watch. In Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, they're going to launch an ICBM, a test missile. 
It had it first stage, second stage, third stage, with ten dummy nuclear warheads. Okay, they wanted to uh, watch it and see how the first stage separated from the second stage. So they put a big telescope in Big Sur, California, which could watch that. And so the Big Sur telescope is watching it separating, and it's uh, and they're actually a close-up shot, and they see a UFO come close to the ICBM and shoot it down. Okay? Those are animated pictures. Here's a video of the guy. It was pretty exciting optics. And then on that telescope, we could see the warhead, the dummy warhead. According to Jacobs, at this stage, the rocket was traveling between 11 and 14,000 miles per hour when a saucer-shaped craft entered the frame. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of, the, out of space. Now when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. Nearly two decades later, several letters written by Major Florence J. Mansman were obtained. In one dated March 8, 1983, Major Mansman corroborated Lieutenant Jacobs' story. In the film, the assumption was at that time extraterrestrial. Details would be sketchy and from memory. The shape was classic disc. The center seemed... So, what about other interventions? I mean, after all, we had World War II, 60 million dead. Cambodia, 30% of the population was murdered by Pol Pot. We killed 3 million people in Vietnam. There was a famine in China that killed 30 million people. Where were you guys? Where were you when we needed you? Why don't you intervene? You intervened in two places. Now, I want to introduce two hypothetical topics and to finish up this lecture. And you may say, this is ridiculous, Jerry. Yes, if UFOs are not real, this could be ridiculous. But if UFOs are real, I don't think this is ridiculous. First, the comment is, these people, these aliens are not gods. They aren't infallible. If they messed with our evolutionary biology, they made a few mistakes along the way. We are flawed. So number one observation is, they made a couple mistakes Second observation I want to make is, are they really trying to communicate to us and maybe we're just too pig-headed to pay attention? So let's take a look at the first idea. They aren't gods. They aren't infallible. They made a few mistakes. For example, animals do not generally destroy their own habitat. Elephants, they say, will destroy their own habitat. Okay. But not many other species. We do. Global warming is a very good, we know it's a problem. Yes, we do. We think we're doing something about it. We see, uh, I mean, Copenhagen plans to be carbon neutral in 2025. Uh, we see those windmills going up. Uh, we see solar farms going up. We say, well, we're, we're trying to make some progress. The fact is, maybe Ontario is making progress, but the human race is doing nothing about global warming. Watch this. That's CO2. You may not like this data, but uh, I've written a book on this subject, so I kind of know what I'm talking about. That's CO2. Do you see it stopping? Do you see it leveling off? Do you see it bending? See it going down? Zero. That's the human race going straight up, folks. This is methane, much worse than CO2. Going straight up, folks. This is nitrous oxide going straight up. This is 2023, okay? The, the human race is doing nothing about global warming. Now, I want to show you something. I'm playing with this data. Play along. Okay, there it is. I'm going to extend that. That means, that line that I just drew means we're going to continue to do nothing. All right, what happens? Well, 
that's when you get to 1.5 degrees of warming, okay? And that is when you get to 2 degrees of warming. That's 450 parts per million. 6,000 articles, academic articles, say that. That doesn't mean you're going to get to 2 degrees of warming when you get to 450. There's a couple of years lag between temperature and CO2. But that's when you cross the threshold. That's when you can't put the genie back in the bottle. I'm going to do this again just to show you something else. There's 1.5 degrees of warming. There's 2. De degrees of planetary warming. Now, I'm going to extend the x-axis. Watch this. Here we go. X-axis going out. Now, I'm going to draw a very important line. Follow this arrow. That is when you get to 2 degrees of warming. That's late 2030. That's 15 years from now. This is major. Okay, I mean, there are 35 million refugees in 2023, and they're not all climate refugees. Many of them are running away from poverty. But in if you get to two degrees of warming, you're going to get a billion climate refugees. The tropics, that green part of the planet, becomes almost uninhabitable, unless you want to go to Puerto Rico and enjoy the 125 degree weather. Okay, a one point a billion people will be rushing out either south or north from those tropical regions. We've had lots of civilizations collapse in the past from environmental causes. I'm certain climate change has occurred. Our responses at the moment are inadequate in terms of coping with these newly displaced people. So uh, just this summer, 2023, Phoenix had 110 degrees for 30 days in a row, over 110 degrees. Uh, these are fires in Canada in the summer, sending soot to, in Chicago, New York, people wearing masks. That's the soot crossing the globe. This is huge floods in India, uh, unprecedented in uh, a century. All of this is happening in 2023. Now, if you were a climate scientist and you were commenting about this, you'd only have one conclusion. Okay. And the conclusion is, you ain't seen nothing yet, pal. This is just the beginning. Okay, so first observation is that we are destroying our habitat. Secondly, we are the cause of the sixth mass extinction. We, there have been five extinctions on Earth, asteroids, you know, but this is caused by us, and it's already started. 20% of the human population is threatened with extinction at two degrees of warming. That's 1.6 billion people. We have 15 years to put an end to this, to stop it. Now, why aren't we doing more? Why aren't they doing more? Why aren't they intervening? Well, maybe it's because they don't exist. Or maybe they're just watching. Or maybe they came from the future. I don't have the answer to that. But I can show you something here that I think is important. These are searches on Google for the term. For twice as many people are searching for sexual identity issues than for global warming. I don't know why that is, but we in the West t seem to be obsessed with this, or we're being distracted by it. But it's twice as a, a big search term. Now, uh, is that really a rational response? I'm not sure. But they are less... Dis uh, the Japanese, the Indians, the Chinese don't seem to be that uh, preoccupied with sexual identity issues. So are they making more progress? Are they, are they being less distracted? Well, there's China. They're still going mad. This is ja gasoline consumption in China going straight up. This is India going straight up. They're just being distracted by something else. Nobody's making any progress. Everybody is being distracted by something. So... If these extraterrestrial influences played a role in our evolution, 
or genetically altered us, they made a few mistakes. We're out of control. We're out of balance with nature. Okay? Why aren't they acting? Why aren't they intervening? They're not. So I have said I had two hypothetical comments. One is they aren't gods, they aren't infallible, they made a few mistakes. But the other that I want to talk about to end this lecture is, are they trying to communicate and we're just too pig-headed, too much in the dark ages, we're not listening? Watch. Are they trying to communicate? This is methane, a scientific Lewis diagram of methane. Carbon surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. Those dots are electrons. That's a scientific diagram of methane. Many times worse than CO2. And what is this? This is a crop circle made in 2017. The dots are electrons. Now, if that isn't methane, I don't know what is. Who in God's name would make a crop circle of methane? Now, I'm a psychologist. I'm interested in motivation. Why would you do that? Okay, everybody, most people, think that all crop circles are made by human beings. I have a friend who's a Harvard-educated person who believes in UFOs, and he thinks all crop circles are made by vandals, trespassers. Okay, I don't. So why would you do that? Nobody pays attention to figuring out crop circles. Why would you make a crop circle? Are you an environmental activist? Is that why you did methane? What, 10 people in the world are going to figure that out? Is that how you're going to get your message out? Stop methane? Why don't you join an organization and at protest? Stop fracking. Fracking is what's releasing so much methane into the atmosphere, okay? That sounds reasonable. Here's a Melting permafrost causes methane to go into the atmosphere. Extremely dangerous. Russian guy poking a hole in the melting permafrost, igniting the methane with his son. Be careful. Be careful now. That's igniting methane. Okay, it's, it's melting the permafrost and, and the methane is going into the atmosphere. So, I don't think that crop circle was made by human beings. I think that was a warning. It was a message. Okay? You can laugh all you want. I think it's an extraterrestrial message. Maybe you could prove that wrong. Crop circles really may be attempts to communicate with us. Stay with me. Don't laugh yet. Here's a crop circle in England, right across the river from a nuclear power plant that was 46 years old. People, the neighbors said, close this plant down. We're going to have another Chernobyl. It's too old. It's an old dinosaur. The crop circle appears. And if you analyze it, you see that there is polonium, cesium, astatine encrypted in this crop circle. This crop circle is a message that says there could be a fissile reaction across the river. Okay, it was a message. Nobody paid attention to the message. Three years later, there really was an incident and they closed the, crop, the, the plant down. But there was a crop circle there. And P humans didn't do that. That was an extraterrestrial message. This is a crop circle and someone said, with a, a PhD in physics, said, I think that's a template for a gear, and he made a magnetic, frictionless magnetic gear from that image on the crop circle. He also saw another crop circle and said, I think that is a design for a magnetic propulsion system. And he actually made a motor, a propulsion system from a crop circle. This is a crop circle in a red poppy field. Okay. And a guy said, wait a minute, that's a diagram of vitamin A. What? Why would someone make a crop circle of vitamin A? But he superimposed the molecular diagram of vitamin A on the crop circle, and it was a perfect fit. Almost perfect fit. So my question as a psychologist is, why would somebody do that? And I started reading about it. 
Vitamin A is related to color blindness. Well, it's in a red poppy field. Uh, vitamin A is related to visual pigment, percep pigment perception. It's in a red poppy field. Whoa. Vitamin A is related to color blindness and child mortality and infertility and intelligence and miscarriages. And I never knew any of that. So if you look at that map, everything that's orange or blue or red, that's a vitamin A deficiency. 14% of the human race has a vitamin A deficiency. That was a message. It was an extraterrestrial message saying to improve the human race, you need to remediate vitamin A deficiency. Thank you, E.T. So I wrote a book called Messages from the Guns. Read the subtitle. A Scientific Exposition on the Extraterrestrial Origin of Crop Circles. I analyzed 40 crop circles out of 4,000. There are at least 4,000. I could understand 40. And I consulted with other people, too, and may, used their interpretations as well. Okay, and what do they mean? Well, they're concerned with human welfare. They're concerned with human fertility. They're concerned with gravity. Uh, they're pedagogical, educational, magnetars, fusion, gamma rays, neutron stars. They are concerned with the planet, with nuclear meltdowns and global emissions. They're bi there's even a crop circle that is postulating a, a solar cataclysm in the next three years. So, those are conclusions from 1% of all the crop circles in existence. Okay? What if we woke up? What if we said, this isn't ridiculous. Maybe we ought to pay attention. There are only, I mean, if, oh no, oh, humans made it. They, well, human crop circles are stupid. They are sloppy. They are commercial. They leave footprints. These crop circles, there are no footprints, broken fences, nothing. These are crop circle makers. I've interviewed a few. This is a crime what they're doing. They're destroying a, a farmer's field couple thousand dollars worth of damage. They enjoy what they do. And of course they say, oh, we made everything. We made this or we made that. But they're very confidential and they won't talk to you. <laughs> but they make all these claims. Well, I, if, if you dis, disabuse yourself of the idea that these drunken trespasser vandals made all of the crop circles in the world, uh, what if we woke up and said they need to be deceived? They're probably... From my research, only 50 people in the world seriously trying to decode them. There are people who are selling tickets to crop circles and travel here, and okay, but I don't think there are 50 people in the world who are truly trying to figure them out, okay? Take a look at this. The night this formation came down, um it was windy. This is a high altitude location. This takes a battering by the weather. Um, so anyway, we were within, we were with two other researchers. We were the first little group of people to come in here. No footprints, no mud, no bad, you know, no broken plants. All the centers were perfect. No, no, no sign of human activity or entry into this field. It seemed almost impossible that that could be the work of you know, a few humans going out and smashing the plants down with pieces of wood, it just seemed far too sophisticated, far too perfect. You know, some of these designs, you know, you couldn't draw them out on a piece of paper freehand or with a, with a desk lamp, let alone, you know, a thousand feet wide in a, in, a, in a wheat field, in the dark, in the rain, sometimes it just seemed impossible. So if you open up your mind or we open up our minds and you'd say, what in God's name is that? What's that saying? What secrets could be found here? Look at that. You see people standing there? Are you pretending to yourself that a group of hooligans went in the middle of the night, with, leaving no footprints, no tire tracks, no barking dogs, no witnesses, and they made that colossal, abstract, four, three, four, three, three-dimensional, up, down, in and around, Give me a break. That's saying something, and we have no idea what it's saying. What are these things trying to say? You see the people standing in the center of that? You see a car there on that road? That gives you an idea just how gigantic 
that crop circle is. What is it saying? Why isn't there any, why aren't there a thousand people with PhDs running to try to figure out what that is saying? Why do we have to insist that that's made by drunken vandals? It isn't. What is this saying? It's a, it's a message. And we just all, we're, we're very happy to ignore it. We're very happy to plow it under. Look at this. I'm going to turn it sideways. Okay. What is that saying? That's hundreds of meters long. It's extremely articulate. It's totally inscrutable. And there's nobody interested in figuring out what it's saying. How many people in the world are seriously trying to decode, decode that? Or this? We are living in the dark ages of delusion and denial. There are over a million American university professors who will publicly say there's nothing to see here. Go away. Please don't try to decode that. Please don't try to figure it out. If you do, we're going to call you crazy. What if there were 5,000 professors and societists instead of 50 trying to decode these things? Okay, Look at this. Look at the people standing there. Does anybody have any idea what those things mean? Why do you think, why do people think it's nonsensical to try to explore that? They are frightened of condemnation from their peers if they show any interest in crop circles. Oh my God, how terrible for, did you hear that Professor so-and-so is interested in crop circles? What's happened to him? Oh my God, I think he should, uh, we should get him out of the department, take away tenure. That's what we mean. The orthodoxy will condemn you as a cult, insane, a conspiracy theorist, unbalanced, unscholarly, not worthy of tenure. Okay, we live in the dark ages, folks. And you think I'm exaggerating. That's the story of John Mack, PhD, MD, tenured psychiatrist at Harvard, got interested in UFOs. Oh boy. He was persecuted at Harvard for 10 years. He, had to, he hired a lawyer for, ten, he spent $100,000 of his own money defending himself and his research at Harvard, okay, to keep his position. He was killed by a drunk driver in 2007. And you know what he was talking about? He's talking about the same thing I'm talking about in this video. Here's a little John Mack. See, behind all these questions, all these areas, all this talk about paradigm change and resistance is our worldview or our cosmology, who we are. And so I, the relevance of what I do to that arena is that what I do is a kind of game breaker because it tells us, wake up folks, things are different than you thought, uh, that is. The Western worldview that I was raised in says that uh, we are the top of the intellectual hierarchy in the cosmos, that any perception of God or intelligence is a projection of our own unconscious. I was raised to think that way as a Freudian. And that uh, if people perceive other intelligences out there, then there's, it's, it's interpreted as some kind of psychological problem. But that would be the, the worldview. This phenomenon doesn't lend itself to it. This phenomenon says, no, that's all wrong. So conclusion from this talk, uh, because these dark ages do exist. When the president says UFOs are real, uh, what's going to happen? One last comment. That in the 60s, uh, the uh, government hired a think tank, the Brookings Institute, and uh, should we tell the American people about UFOs? Uh, and the, the Brookings Institute said, no, it will um, cause panic. It'll destabilize society. Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock in the 70s. He was interviewed and they said, I think our, our Americans ready to hear about uh, UFOs and extraterrestrials.
He said, I don't think so. George Bush Sr., in his 90s, in a wheelchair, goes to Orlando, Florida, and he was going to make a speech uh, um, promoting his son Jeb, who wanted to be the Republican nominee. He was going to make a speech for his son. But somebody raised their hand and said, Mr. President, when is the government going to tell the truth about UFOs? And he lost his filter. And he said, Americans can't handle the truth. And they said, what did the guy just say? Let's wheel him off stage. Let's get him out of here. And they wheeled him out of the stage. This congressman, two weeks ago, was watching UFO footage, still classified. And he said, we can't handle this. There is good reason to believe that we may not handle this information well. Pathologies could develop. New religions could develop. New cults could develop. Uh, people committing suicide, uh, people are saying, I'm in touch with aliens, new prophets, do crazy things happening. All of that could happen from this, as predicted. Unpredictable consequences. But my opinion is, we need to face reality. Okay, If this is reality, it's time to put an end to the dark ages. Time to allow scientists and professors to explore these questions They'd like to, they just don't want to be ashamed uh, and shamed into poverty by their colleagues. They would be interested in looking in these questions if they could, if they were allowed. What follows the Dark Ages could be the Age of Enlightenment. I think we need to be given a chance. This, take a look, this is planet Earth. I want you to pay attention to the last 15 years. Now, we're in 1970. Blue is cold, all right? So I want you to pay attention to what happens in the last 15 years. We're up to 1990. Wait till you get to 2005. Okay, 2007. There you go. Now, here we go. They're slowing it down. This is uh, the last 15 years of planet Earth. Okay? 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. The question is, can you imagine the next 15 years? I mean, we're in serious shape here. We, will we be rescued by nuclear fusion? Gosh, I hope so. Will we be distracted to death and keep doing what we're doing? Gosh, I hope not. Will 5,000 people instead of 50 start trying to decode crop circles? There are at least 2,000 messages that have gone undeciphered. I don't know the answers to those questions, folks. But I do know that we must put an end to the dark ages we are living in. Okay, because we are living in them. And if this comes to pass, okay, uh, we are going to have a revolution in archaeology, anthropology, history, mythology, evolutionary biology, crop circles, who knows what else. Because we're living in the dark ages and we don't know it. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, all the references on for this talk are in my book. All right. You can get the book at Amazon. Uh, you can contact me at that. That's my website. Uh, thank you very much for uh, enduring this for this whole period of time.